Hi everybody, it's your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing Unit 8 on Ecology and AP Biology by getting into Topic 8.6, which is on Biodiversity. And this is an idea that we have talked about a couple times in this class before, um, but allow us to reiterate on what that is and put that in the context of an ecosystem. So we're going to learn a couple new terms today, and one of those is ecosystem. So, as I was saying before in our last video, um, we can study ecology at several different levels, the organismal level, the population level, which we've done, the community level, and we can also study at the ecosystem level as well. And while we won't get into too much detail about ecosystem ecology, because that's arguably the most complex type of ecology, it will be helpful to know what an ecosystem is and what factors play a role in an ecosystem. Um, the main, uh, main one that plays a role in an ecosystem is biodiversity which is the general term for the variety of living things and life processes in a population, community, or ecosystem. Um, and you might already know why biodiversity might be important in an ecosystem or in a population, because we've talked about it in this class before, in fact, in one of these videos. Um, so community diversity, as we talked about in our last video, as measured by Simpson's Diversity Index, is com important to community health. Um, so diversity is a really, really, really good thing for an ecosystem, particularly one that is at risk like this wetland ecosystem. These are disappearing across the world, and it's really, really important to maintain them. So what kind of organisms need to be in there? What kind of populations need to be in this ecosystem in order to sustain it? Um, so by the way, ecosystem, let's define that. All organisms in a given area as well as abiotic factors in which they interact. Abiotic meaning non-living. Um, so basically, an ecosystem not only consists of the community, which is all the populations of organisms, it's the community plus the environment that they live in. So this, this is ecology in a nutshell, trying to figure out how organisms interact with their environment and why that's important. Um, so let's get into it. Why is biodiversity important? Ecosystems with fewer components and little diversity are less resilient to changes in the environment. So back in topic 7.12, uh, we talked about variations in populations and why that is ultra, ultra important. Because if everybody's the same in a population and there is very, very little genetic variation, then that means that this population is not going to evolve. It's not going to undergo natural selection because that's the key components of natural selection. It can't happen without genetic variation in that population. And something similar um, occurs in an ecosystem. An ecosystem with less diversity, with less variation between populations, is less resilient to changes in the environment. If something happens to this environment, something changes, because Earth changes a lot, um, and everything is the same in an environment, then there's a less likely of a chance of some organisms or some populations or some species being able to adapt and better survive in that new environment after the changes have occurred. Um, so in actually 7.2, I used these same two images. We compared a field of crops, which is often referred to as a monoculture, as in there's like one type of species, um, versus a tropical rainforest. A rainforest is going to have thousands and thousands of different types of organisms. And a field of crops isn't going to have that many. So which one is going to be more resilient to changes? It's going to be the rainforest. I know that doesn't seem likely because, you know, crops are showing up everywhere. You, I mean, where I live in the world, you look around and there's crops literally everywhere. Um, but rainforests are disappearing. But that's our fault. That's human beings' fault. That's not uh, any fault of, you know, the environment changing. This is theoretically higher uh, chance of surviving changes to their environment because of the extreme biodiversity that you can find in a rainforest as opposed to a cornfield or a wheat field. Okay, um, so how does an ecosystem function? Well, uh, how do we know if an ecosystem is healthy and how does it really, how does it exist? Um, producers or vegetation, the you know, our autotrophs, our photoautotrophs in um, terrestrial ecosystems or even aquatic ecosystems, um, they're absorbing energy from the sun and converting it into a form that uh, heterotrophs can consume, right? And really, they're at the bottom of that trophic pyramid, and they are providing energy for the entire ecosystem. Okay, so it goes without saying that without producers, without vegetation, ecosystems are screwed. Hey, there's no energy for anybody if, if uh, the producers are gone. Hey, these were supposed to have arrowheads on them, but I just kind of highlighted here. Uh, if we take a look at this, this is the same food web that I actually used for an example in topic 8.2. Um, this is a wetland ecosystem. 
If we take a look at the cattails, the algae, and the, it looks like, coontails, um, and then all types of plants that you can find in a, in a pond or a wetland, um, they're providing energy for all these different organisms up here, and by extension, but for the largemouth bass and the great blue heron as well. So in one way or another, these producers are providing energy for everything else. They're at the bottom of the trophic pyramid. Um, and another kind of thing that we're going to find in an ecosystem, while maybe it's, maybe it's the producer, maybe it's not, um, but it's called the dominant species. That plays a big role in the ecosystem because it's the most abundant species in the community. Okay, so again, if we go back to uh, community ecology and talk about Simpson's Diversity Index, if we have a very, very, very dominant species um, and there's other species in the area, but they're not quite as relative as... Uh, they're not quite as abundant relative to the dominant species, then is that species as healthy and as resistant to change as, say, one with more relative abundance between species? Hard to say, right? But we can use math to try and figure that out, Simpson's Diversity Index, as we did in our last video. Okay, so uh, producers are really important, dominant species are really important, but one of the key points here that I want to make um, is that some species, even though there's not that many of them in an ecosystem, they are often the most important species. Um, and the keystone of an arch, if you know anything about architecture, an archway, um, there, there's often one stone in the middle of the arch at the very, very top um, that holds the whole arch together. If you take that, art, that stone out, the whole arch will fall apart. And that's what a keystone species is like in an ecosystem. That's a species that is not abundant, but exerts control over a community via its ecological niche or ecological niche. Um, so a keystone species in this food web would be presumably the great blue heron um, because the great blue heron, take a look at what it eats. It eats the, uh, the sunfish. It eats the, uh, is that a shad it looks like? Um, it, it eats tadpoles. It eats the largemouth bass. Um, it eats a lot of stuff, right? And it plays an important role in that it regulates the populations of all the other um, species in the, in the community and in the ecosystem. So... If, the, if we were to suddenly remove the great blue heron from this ecosystem, who knows what would happen to the largemouth bass or the, the, the sunfish or the shad or any of those other fish that are in here? Um, what would happen to their populations? And how would their populations affect all the other populations? So it's really like a, it's really like a puzzle almost. If you take a piece out, the whole thing will fall apart. And that's what makes this a keystone species. We won't know what happens if we take this out. But more, more than likely, the ecosystem collapses once a keystone species has been taken out. Keystone species have a disproportionate influence on their ecosystems relative to their abundance. If you take them out, the ecosystem is screwed. Very similar to what happens with producers if you don't have them. Okay, a good story about keystone species um, in the United States, in uh, the oldest national park, it's Yellowstone National Park, wolves were gone for a very long time. Um, people hunted them to near extinction, and they had a really hard time recovering. That was up until about the 1990s when uh, wolves were reintroduced by people into the park. Okay? So they had been gone for a long time, extinct from the area for a long time, but they were brought back, and the impact that the wolves had on the ecosystem was astounding. They reduced the amount of elk that were in the area, so the elk were overabundant. Um, and elk would ravage plant populations, or would be all these different types of plants because they're herbivores, right? And uh, once the elk were reduced by their natural predators, a lot of the plant species that the elk used to eat would come back. And once those plant species came back, a lot of other species that uh, um, the producers and the plants supported also made a huge comeback. Okay, so just by adding that one piece back into the puzzle, of the Yellow, Yellowstone National Park ecosystem, we have now have a thriving ecosystem um, in that area. And lots of species have made a recovery just on account of the wolves coming back, which is a, it's a remarkable. It's a great recovery um, conservation biology story. Okay, um, I believe that'll be it for this video. We're going to get into topic 8.7, which I haven't made yet. Um, but we're going to get into the last topic of AP biology in our next video. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you next time.